please come to order. Councillor Dobbins, would you lead us to the invitation? Father, well, thank you for this uh, special time that uh, we have to function as a body the, to serve the needs of the Cherokee people. May we do so in a respectful way, a, a way that would be pleasing to you. Uh, may everything we say and do be uh, pleasing to you, and uh, we pray we do the will of the people today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bill Anglin. Honey. Here. 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 Uh, has everybody uh, read the minutes? And I'll entertain a motion to approve them. I have a motion they be approved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those in favor. Reports. Claremore Service Unit is. George. Oh, George isn't with George us today. George is not here. <laughs> George is uh, traveling back from New York today. I'm Dr. Gary Lang, the clinical director at Claremore Indian Hospital. And Happy to be here, and George sends you his greetings. Here, um, I'm sorry, is it Dr. Lane or Dr. Lang? L A N G. Lane. L A N G. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. We're happy to have you here. How are things going on with our Claremore service unit? We're we're doing well. Things are things are uh, trucking as always. As far as the report that George sent in, uh, we're as far as staffing on the med staff side, we are still looking for a general surgeon. Uh, and one midwife. Uh, our outpatient visits now, I think the report that George sent in said our uh, April visits were down 31%. We reran those numbers, they were actually only down 2.6%. Because uh, I was thinking, we looked busy in April, I'm not sure what was going on. But the other numbers are correct, but we're only down 2.6% over April last year. Our revenue uh, over uh, has actually increased 28%. Uh, over the same time period. Uh, services, um, George wanted me to mention that the orthopedic, our orthopedic patients uh, through PRC are still being sent to Tulsa at the orthopedic center through the surgical hospital uh, contract. Our ER model, remodel is really close. Um, we should be, the uh, construction folks should hand that back over to us by the end of the month. They keep telling me one more week. One more week. Once the construction folks hand it back over to us, then our guys get in, put up the monitors, put in the computers. So it'll probably be a couple weeks uh, past that. But we're looking forward for that to open up. Our planning on having once we get everything uh, set up and things working, and we know things are flowing, to have some kind of open house. So be watching for that because we want to show that off. Um, as far as workload, outpatient visits again down 2.6 percent. We for for April there are 24,434 patients. Those numbers, uh, as far as Cherokee Nation patients, were correct. There are 11,944 visits that included 6,100. Uh, Cherokee Nation patients. Uh, dental down a little bit, 1.9%. Uh, um, we had 811 patients, of which 590 were Cherokee Nation citizens. Admissions were down 8.6%. Almost all of our uh, 64 admissions were Cherokee Nation, 61 of the 64. Uh, we had 22 no newborns, which is steady. We are on uh, track, I think, to have a higher number of newborns. We had 307 last year, but we've already had 208 wow. this year. So I think what those numbers are going to be up. And there were 347 new charts and 126 reactivates. Um, as far as our collections, Medicare, we collected in April uh, 720,000. Uh, 1.14 million in Medicaid, 986,000 private insurance, and 44,000 by in uh, from the VA. So we had a, almost a 2.9 million uh, uh, collections for the month. Uh, Year-to-date collections are 18.5 uh, uh, million. 
Uh, amount billed for April was five and a half million, and our collections are up from last year by uh, four million from uh, uh, last year at the same time period. PRC, uh, we had 420, uh, we had 1,195 files to our committee for the month. We funded 429, of which 173 were Cherokee Nation patients. Um, we had 412 denials, of which 121 were Cherokee Nation patients, and deferred 326 uh, pe uh, cases, of which 137 were Cherokee Nation patients. I think George included, he, he gave me, a, a, as far as ancillary services go, we saw 139 patients in audiology and uh, dispense 40 hearing aids, 811 uh, in patient encounters in dental, uh, diabetes clinic had 146 consults, our outpatient uh, laboratory or our laboratory overall saw 2,200 patients and ran almost 11,000 tests. Outpatient uh, pharmacy prescribed 28,800 prescriptions. Physical therapy saw 235 patients. Radiology had 2,400 uh, patient encounters, and respiratory therapy had 230, and we uh, uh, placed 39 Holter monitors. Wow, that's quite a report. Wow, thank you. <laughs> tell, tell George you represent him very well. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Councilor Crittenton. Yes, sir. Doctor, on your audiology, uh -huh. how big of a waiting list do you have? Uh, I think right now, and I haven't I haven't checked in a bit, but it is a couple a few months. Uh, we know that we are starting to get a lot of influx because some of the others were overflowing uh, as well. So we do have we do have a waiting list. So a couple of months. Yeah. Okay. I'll double check when I get back. But that last time I think we checked on that, it was. Now, how would a you might I don't know the specifics, but in. I talked to Dr. Jones and sound like we got a good plan with the new clinic coming for I think three three places for audiologists. Oh that would be very helpful. I think we've got six to eight months waiting uh, and I'm looking forward to the plan that's coming up but how would that work if uh, one of our the problem I ran into is I had an elder call and they went elsewhere for the for the hearing screening and the Found with, I'm not sure how that works, but you know they got the referral to go there. But, to an outside right, audiology, but a then private they audiologist. They wasn't getting their hearing aids paid for, mm -hmm. and it made sense what Dr. Jones had said because there's such a long list, and if this person chooses to go somewhere else, it's kind of kind of cutting the line a little bit. Which, mm -hmm. but could could uh, someone from my area? Come to your I'd have place. to check and see. Now I know I know we've got some patients waiting just for rechecks and some patients waiting for hearing aid and I have to check on what the hearing aid waiting time is. But I could But you think it's just a couple months? I I I would think I'm thinking the hearing aid tests are longer than that. But let me uh, let me get with my audiologist and I can get you an answer back. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? Yes, Councilor Buzzer. Uh, Dr. Lane, you'd answered the first question about <coughs> uh, April being 31% down. I, I caught that, so that's good. I, the other question I've got is the report says in, uh, in the month that you saw 17,273 patients. Then you gave us some more number about the patients in audiology, lab, dental, things like that. Those are not including in those numbers? No, no. Okay. I mean, so those, actually that uh, that number instead of 17,000 yeah. is 24,000, but we have the ER visits and all the ambulatory care clinics that are a part of that number. I'm wondering, can you catch that and report that also? Yeah, we could. We can ask them to get okay. those numbers as well. I'd like well. to see that. Uh, I know our ER is seeing over a hundred a day now uh, on a routine yeah, yeah, basis. Yeah, I think that's important uh, to see those numbers. Okay, I'll, I'll ask them okay. to bring those. Yeah, because you read some numbers off there and it added up to quite a few. Well, I'm, it didn't so, add up to that. Because well, I know, all, I know, yeah, but because I all the, yeah, like our ER yeah. and all our, uh, 
Those are more ancillary yeah, uh, service numbers that we did. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you. Have any questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have, a, I have one. Uh, Dr. Lang, you're down on outpatient visits, dental visits, and admissions. Is that a time situation? Have you compared it from a year ago? The well, same time frame? You, know, you know, as far as they, they <coughs> tend to oscillate, and I, as far as just their out, total outpatient numbers, we had 26,000, we had 24,000 in April, we had 26,000 the month before, we had 26,000 the month after. So I think some of that is just an oscillating number. Um, I don't, we're not seeing, definitely not seeing any downward trends. Uh, one other question. Uh, the VA on your collections, uh, is that in acute care? Or do, I mean, does the VA pay regularly? I haven't noticed If they before. have, if, yeah, if they have uh, resources with VA, they come in for even an office visit or an ER visit, we can, we can bill the VA. I learned something today because I, I know that there's been legislation of some type to where VA hospital or VA our veterans can now attend go to an acute care facility, but I didn't realize that you had a contract to where you could take VA. I've learned something here today. Thank you for that. Yeah, there's, it's pretty small, as as sure. opposed to the other the other resources. But yes, we can. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm I'm proud to hear that and learn that today. Anybody else have any other questions for Dr. Lane? Good report. It's a great report, Dr. Lang. I hope oh. you get to come back and see us again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Jones. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Dr. Jones. Good afternoon. How are things going? Going well. Talk about the report first. Your questions after that, I suppose. That's okay with you. Sure, fire away. So um, I'll just highlight some of the things in our report. Um, of course, we had the groundbreaking for the OSU College of Medicine. Many of you attended attended that on uh, May the 20th. Um, we had 109,500 ambulatory visits this last month, which was up again. Every month it seems to be increasing. Um, our, Someone always asks about our top two diagnosis. Hypertension and diabetes were our top two diagnosis this month or in the month of May, which is what we're looking at. Uh, if you go over to the third page of your report, you can see the vacancy rate, 4.7 percent, uh, opposed to the IHS rate, which is the benchmark that we kind of follow, which is 25 percent. If you go down to the next category under contract health, you'll see it shows 11.2 million in the red. Now, I want to explain that a little bit. Um, and what that means is uh, right now, projected out, we're going to be over budget that much. Doesn't mean we're denying anybody. But those that projection is based on obligated funds. So if we refer someone out, and I'm going to put this in simple math, if we refer somebody out for a $1,000 referral, then we obligate and take $1,000 off the books. Okay? It's like a line of credit. Now, whenever that person goes out for the referral and they, let's say they have Medicaid or Medicare or some type of third party payer, when all that's said and done, we may not have to pay a full thousand dollars. We may only have to pay a hundred dollars or hundred and fifty dollars or whatever that is. And then that money is reconciled back onto the books. But we have to obligate that not knowing what that payment's going to be down the line. Does that make sense? So that's why that number gradually decreases as we get through the year. Because I think when we first started out, it showed like 25 million, and we've, it gradually works its way down as the year goes, because we're reconciling those accounts or those contracts that we've, that we've obligated. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, this month, in the month of May, we spent $4.7 million on contract health. That's actually money spent. Uh, you'll see the approval rate there is 97.1% this month. I told you it kind of fluctuates between 96.5 and 98.5%. We're at 97.1 this time. Uh, if you go over to the next page, you can see that employee care visits were up everywhere. Uh, they were a little bit down at Hastings, but the rest of the clinics, they were up. Um, the third party revenue is up at every single clinic except for <coughs> dental. And we attribute that to Wilma P being closed right now. So we're a little bit behind on dental. But if you look at the uh, combined revenue for the year, we're way ahead of where we were last year. 
And if you look at the dental service minutes, I know that's been a, something that we've talked about a few times, or service, services by month, and we've talked about that a little bit. The total visit still is high, or is uh, at a higher rate than it was in 2018. The walk-ins stayed about the same, and our scheduled exams were actually up. And then uh, each quarter on the last page, we give you a different piece of information depending on what quarter it is. And this time it was refills or uh, prescriptions filled by site because someone had asked about that in, at some point in time, wanted to know how many prescriptions we were, we were filling. So you have a breakdown for each site on how many prescriptions were filled. New versus, versus refills. Any other <coughs> questions? I'll be glad to answer. Okay, any questions? Councilor Watkins. Hey, Dr. Jones, uh, I've seen the, the ambulance uh, statistics were really high. And, you know, visiting with some of those, uh, those ambulance drivers, a lot of them are, are working very long shifts and they're making five or six trips to Tulsa. And uh, a lot of them are kind of concerned about the safety. Is uh, what's is there a plan in place or is there something we can do on maybe increasing drivers or buying uh, more ambulance, ambulances to uh, help out with this, uh, with this need? And, and the safety, they're worried about the safety for because they're yeah, working well they're, longer shifts? Because I'm not aware that they're working longer shifts or just working, those shifts are, are set. They don't have longer shifts based on- I think on they're making multiple trips to Tulsa and they're driving very sleepy, they're fatigued, and they're not, and they're putting themselves as well as the patients in, at risk. And uh, are you guys aware of this? I'm not aware of that. I'm, I mean, if it's a, uh, if an employee feels like they're not safe to drive, they should be reporting that There's to employees, us. And it's been brought up before. Uh, I think, I'll ask them, I asked them for solutions. And they and their solution was to get purchase some more ambulances and to get some more drivers. Because from from what I, my understanding is that the city is using our services as well, because they're short ambulance drivers. And um, I don't know. It, it just it, it, has anyone else ex heard anything about this about ambulances the shortage and it's just it, I think. What, what the issue is, Dr. Jones, is they're making multiple trips to Tulsa um, in a 12-hour period, and it's uh, they're all they're all worried about the safety of themselves and the patients that that they're transporting. Okay. I will check into it and get the supervisor of the uh, ambulance service to look into it and see see what the issue is. I'm not aware of any issue right now. Uh, we look at their you know we are always looking at compensation we're looking at staffing and things of that nature and we've asked for staffing um, recommendations for the 2020 budget year and and uh, that, that was the other question was have you guys I mean since budgeting is coming up for the next fiscal year has there been any budgeting in the ambulance department we've asked every every single department and director had an opportunity to present to us what they felt like they needed for success for 2020. And we've looked at every single one of those things and tried to meet everyone's needs. Hmm. But I'm not aware of any uh, specific items with, with EMS, but I will check into it and see. Could you uh, report back to us sure. on that next, next month? All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councilor Light. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Doc, the, the incident at Hastings, and there was going to be a blue ribbon panel and a report coming from that panel. Has that been released yet, or do we have that for the nurse incident? Uh, I believe that that was um, concluded, and I thought that it was shared with each and every one of you, was my understanding. Could, could you double check that? I never saw it come across. It might Mr. Have. Dobbins, are you aware if they were going to share that with everybody? I've not heard. No, I've not heard. 
and and thank you. And one more, the when, when I heard my fellow counselor discuss and our ambulance is being shared, and I guess maybe telephone city. I'm not sure. Is that does that happen? Or? Well, I think they're they're the usage of the ambulance service is is cooperative, but I know that they are specifically like work cooperation. <laughs> My district also yeah. is the reason I'm asking. Well, and ambulance services are lo geographically local to a facility, a area. Yeah. So does the Cherokee Nation go to the Kansas line or not? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So we'd like to have that same cooperation is all I'm asking. Thank you. Councilor Crittenden. Yeah. Doctor, we get with the other doctor there and give me an answer if that would be something possible to some of my folks instead of waiting the what we got right now maybe head to Claire more yeah I'm not sure about how the referral process works I know that typically when Cherokee people are referred to uh, Claire Moore a lot of times they are sent on to us mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know about that no, we had to be a, a better answer for that I know that we've ran into some other issues where other services are being uh, automatically referred to us and uh, just because they're Cherokee and they they send them on to us rather than right. and uh, we had a good talk the doctor and me about audiologist and was I on the right track what we discussed right we're gonna get three <coughs> three booths that are our uh, we just uh, dr. Montgomery and I had talked we just had interviewed someone recently so we're, you know, that's one of the positions that we highlighted to, to be hiring initially when we opened that clinic. So, because that's one of the service lines that we've identified as being in need. So, yeah, that'll be changing soon. We talked about a six to eight month waiting period right now. So, yeah, you we'll hit, you hit with that math a little bit. So, cut down three more well. is gonna cut down tremendously. Right. We always have an influx when we open a new facility and people can use the facility so sometimes the patient pool goes up too but but the, the thinking is with the services that we're going to be offering we're going to be able to reduce that like we talk to you you do what you can do with your money and uh, you know when you talk about elders uh, elder 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 um, <clears throat> that's one of the first things that goes you know is their hearing and I think it's high time that we have more than one. Yeah, we've identified in, that in and we're obviously are right. addressing that. Right. So. Right. And also, we talked about the Steelwell Clinic. And can you give you an update on that? Uh, we have paid this. Uh, the city has been paid to, to dig and do the taps for the trailers. We're waiting on them to do their work. But I did uh, confirm that they have received our payment to do the things that they need to do. And we can't do anything until they do their stuff so we're waiting on them to do that and then we'll be able to start setting trailers so okay and I'm, I'm glad that we're leaving some of those services there on site and then this last <coughs> thing doctor I'm gonna be respectful because yeah. I'm rooting for you it behooves me to root for you because you know you help my people I'm gonna be respectful here but but it hit me hit me wrong doctor there's a there's a high-ranking official at, at the Muskogee Clinic uh, that's been quoting you and and the quote was and and I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt said uh, you didn't say it but but something to the tune of your job would be a whole lot easier if it wasn't for the ignorant council <laughs> do you think I would say uh, think, do you think that that would be something well, now, here, mouth? now here's what I would ask you is <laughs> Is I'm not going to name names. I have the name, but I would, I would uh, definitely have a little meeting with, with now the higher ups. It's not the, it wasn't a doctor or anything, but somebody that has to do with the running of the clinic. And it, you know, it's, it's a fact that it came out of his mouth. And I was concerned that you may have someone quoting things that you would not ever want anybody to, to, to say. I can assure you that did not come out of my mouth. Right. I believe you. I believe you. But but it did someone else's, and and uh, they have a pretty high-ranking job up there. And I'm just going to give you a chance to meet with them. And sure. Be glad to be glad to know who's 
quoting and misquoting me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have, I just want to uh, let the committee know we do have two more reports today after Dr. Jones. Councillor Buzzard. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and I just want to echo Councillor Lay's request about ambulance services because we only have, we have one in Jay. At least we have an ambulance service. But uh, we'd like to see the Cherokee Nation spread out further with ambulatory care. So that's my speech on that. But anyway, I have a couple other things. One is a storm shelter. Um, safer room at the clinic in J. I understood uh, when it was built uh, that the uh, public couldn't use the storm shelter. But after thinking about it again, I'm, I'm requesting that that storm shelter be opened up to the public. Uh, I don't know why they said it couldn't be used. I've come to Miss Davis when she was the director over there. Uh, if it's not FEMA approved, then I don't think it is FEMA approved. But, uh, I think when a storm comes, people are really not questioning it. Well, if it's FEMA, they're not going to a safe place to go. And I think it's a fair, I think it's a safe place because those walls are probably a foot thick with reinforced uh, rebar in it. Uh, so if you could check on that and see uh, if we could open it up to the public, and those things could be arranged with the fire departments or the sheriff or something like that if it can be done. So if you check on that, I'd appreciate it. And I know the. Uh, Citizens there in Jay and Delaware County would appreciate it too because there's not a place to go there in the town of Jay. Okay. Uh, the other thing, I need you to take a look at this, Dr. Jones. I've noticed on the uh, reports through the uh, for the pharmacy, the Jay pharmacy is really extended uh, new charts more than probably. Well, I looked at Muskogee. They're just they're just as much as. Uh, New charts made in J and refill prescription for new charts as are in Muskogee and any other clinic involved. We have four pharmacists up there. I don't know how many we have in Muskogee. I don't know how many we have in the other clinics, but I've had some patients talk to me and say there's a long waiting period when they go back there to get the, the, the refills. And it could be, and, I'm, and this is a good thing, you know, that uh, our providers are pretty much almost 100% there. And uh, what I understand, some of the patients, uh, patient time is cut in half. It used to be 20 minutes. They looked at them and went back to 10 on some patients that didn't need a lot of uh, work. So that may be the cause of it, but uh, if you would check on that and see, because I'm almost to the point of saying we may want to look at another pharmacist up there. Well, part of, the, part of it is that you are fully staffed yeah, yeah. now, and so you're going to have a lot more patients going through, and Dr. McCauley has been very good to work on efficiencies yeah, right. and working on getting patient wait times down, getting more patients in yeah. access, opening access. So you're going to have a little of that. And the other thing is you've got a new clinic, so you have a lot of people that may have been going to other clinics that are now are coming back to that clinic. So, well, I think uh, we've solved one problem now. We may have created a log jam in the pharmacy a little bit. The other thing is... Uh, Uh, oh, the, the reporting, I don't know if you heard me talk to or ask Dr. Lang about the reporting numbers on his, but is our numbers included, the total number of patients that we see is, is uh, pharmacy included, lab, lab diabetic people, typically, people, is it reporting the total numbers? Typically, the numbers that you're seeing on page... Uh, let's see, that'd be page three, four, page four across yeah. the top are your ambulatory care visits. Those aren't, we, okay. do, we do separate dental out separately on, um, yeah, I see that on there, but we don't typically separate the others out. So, okay, so those that are going to be that. ancillary visits that aren't included in that number. Those are your, are your primary coming in for the, uh, to see, you know, a physician or, or a provider. So that doesn't include, uh, if someone's coming in for a refill, no, day. it's not included in there. Okay. Yeah. If they're just coming into the pharmacy to see a refill or something like that, yeah. Those numbers would be easy to get, though, because they have to check in up front. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure on refills if they check in up front when they come in. I think they just check in at the pharmacy. Yeah, I don't think yeah. they do the refill, but I'm talking about blood work and oh, yeah. diabetes yeah. and stuff like that. Okay, well, I'm just wondering about the numbers. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilor Shambaugh. Uh, just have a quick observation, and I have my little question. But um, on your on your ambulance service on transports, I guess do you uh, 
run a backup system where if the main crew that's on duty, uh, say they have to go to Tulsa, I mean, how many ambulance crews do you have on at one time at Tahlequah? That I'm not sure of. I'd have to get with the director and find well, out. Well, if, if there's one on and uh, if, I don't know, they're used, a lot of uh, ambulance services use a backup crew where if one gets called out, then the backup crew gets called in to cover for the <coughs> ones who are transporting. Um, but if the transport uh, is known that it's going to happen in 30 minutes or whatever, then the backup crew can be paged in who are rested up right. and they can do the transport and the regular crew goes on calls. Right. Um, that happens in a lot of places. And I know that in our, you know, we do have one ambulance service, but we do have cooperative agreements with other cities. If our ambulance goes out, you know, they cover for us and then we have to cover for them too. And I think fatigue and 12 hour shifts is, is pretty much common wide state, state wide, but there are ways to maybe uh, like backup crews, uh, that, that can help with things like that. But that's just my um, two cents on that. Right. And, and during the severe weather, of course, the helicopters were grounded, so we we're having to use a lot of ground transport where in other ways, you know, other situations we wouldn't. But if you might check yeah. to see how many crews are on, if not, if they're on a backup system, that's, that may be something that could help that situation. Um, but I guess my question is, do we have a program for, I've had several uh, questions about uh, portable oxygen tanks. Do we supply any of those to people if they're in need of elders? We do have a program for that, yes. Okay. I'll talk to you after yeah. this. We do. It's the MERP program, and, and, um, and we do, yeah. Okay. All right. I'll talk to you here in a bit. Thank you, sir. Okay. Councilor Dobbins. <coughs> uh, Dr. Jones, this is just a comment, not a question. Uh, Dr. Jones on page 9 of the Health Committee report. Noted again our vacancy rate, 4.7 versus 25%, 4.7 our vacancy rate. Uh, the medical recruiter from Cherokee Nation said that is an all-time low vacancy rate uh, in our provider rate. And uh, you know, from time to time, I'd, in the past several months, I'd hear, well, we got doctors just running out the exit doors. And we do. We still lose doctors. I have doctors make suggestions to me. but. I think particularly the last couple of years, I think we have done what we can to improve the environment for our docs, and, uh, and this statistic speaks to that. So uh, anyway, I just didn't want to let that go without at least drawing attention to it, because that's that 4.7, that's that's pretty heady stuff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilor Light. And, and it is good, Doc. Maybe just mean old council complaining for several years now. Maybe it paid off. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever think of that? Because I see this gentleman listen to us. I see some couple of folks behind that listen to us, and and a couple of folks that aren't here listen to us. And I know a lot of effort went into that recruiting, and some of it may have come because our constituents talk to us, we talk to these men and women, and it helped. Thank you. And, and the council-led survey that we initiated a couple of years ago, I think, stimulated a lot of the perhaps changes that were made. A lot of positive changes. Yes, uh, Councilor Warner. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Well, Doc, I just kind of want to echo what Councilor Dobbins was saying and what Councilor Lay appreciate, and Harley brought up something I think that's a big deal, and I appreciate you, the, you know, taking that 20 minutes down to 10 minute time. I mean, that's a that's a big deal when you look at different things. So, thank you for doing it, and I appreciate you for listening. And, and you got a good team behind you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. Do we lease all of our answers or do we own any of them? They're typically GSA vehicles, so we have to put in a requisition and, and purchase them through the GSA program. Uh, and they typically are lease purchase or lease vehicle. That by far the cheapest way to go. Absolutely. Council one. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. And Doc, you know we were talking about ambulance service. If you could, can you give us some kind of breakdown uh, about cost of what what we're talking about, how we run here, and what it would be if we put some other things out there and stuff it up. Yeah, and I think you know, and I'm I'm speaking a little out of turn. I don't know all the regulations associated with them, but there there are regulations yep. to geographical mm -hmm. locations right. and infringing on other geographical locations, so but there are can, some, yeah. some specific well, uh, rules. We have an ambulance service in Salisaw and Sequoia County area and stuff, but um, but no, I'd be interested in seeing some numbers. 
Thank you. Anybody else with questions? I have just a couple or so here. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, last month, I believe it was last month, we were offering free iPads if people signed up for marketplace insurance. Is that correct? That's through a grant, yes. And it's a, uh, it's not an iPad. It is a, it is a, um, it's not actually an Apple product, Chrome but book. there is a, a touchpad that's uh, offered, and it's uh, if they sign up through, um, I think it's a macro grant is the name of the grant, but I'm sorry, what macro grant? grant, I believe, is macro? the name of the grant. Yeah, and it's it provides those that, if you remember, about six months ago, they that same grant provided tumblers, OU and OSU tumblers for people who would sign up, and it's. Uh, it's just an uh, incentive to get people to sign up for Medicaid if they're eligible. For some people, um, maybe eligible, maybe eligible for our services. What well, helps us if they will sign up and get uh, uh, benefits because it helps us on our third-party revenue to provide other services. So even though the services are free to them, it's no cost to the patient. Uh, it's just an incentive program. So the grant was was for Medicaid primarily, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I have a question. Do we sign people up for the marketplace insurance? Yes. And who signs them up? Uh, we have an affordable care team that, that, that does that. Uh, Connie Dunneman is the person, the lead person on that. But we do have a team that, that goes out and, and reaches out and signs people up. And are each one of our patient benefit coordinators or advocates also are trained to be able to sign people up. Are they employed by us or are they employed by the marketplace? No, they're employed by us. Uh, with Marketplace, I know there's a commission. Do we re does Cherokee Nation receive a commission for each person uh, that we sign up? There are some incentives to to um, and yes, there are. We do participate in the ones that we're eligible to participate in. As a tribal entity, we may not be the same eligibility as someone who is uh, on, in a private sector. But yes, we participate in any of the any of the programs that we're allowed to. So uh, if someone signs up a Cherokee citizen for marketplace insurance today at Hastings, will that commission go to Cherokee Nation or does it go to the employee that signed them up? It goes back into the general fund. Into the general fund. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, I want to congratulate you. Last month, the second month in a row, was awesome. I didn't receive one complaint from a provider. <laughs> Not one phone call. Thank Good. you for that. You're doing something right, and I, I applaud your efforts. Uh, that, that's a record, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I have try. to fill that out there. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Was there flooding at Three Rivers? There was no flooding uh, in the facility itself. Um, we made the We closed it down the day after uh, Memorial Day. Just the decision was we were given information on Friday um, by the emergency uh, management team that there was a possibility we were going to lose electricity, water, and sewer. And uh, rather than wait through the weekend and pull staff in, possibly couldn't get to uh, the facility to make calls to patients on Tuesday, we just decided to call and divert what patients needed, absolutely needed to be seen to the closest clinic, and we diverted the employees. We have a, a uh, co-op plan that allows employees to go to the nearest clinic to work so they don't have to miss work. Um, and uh, we decided to make that decision on Friday based on the holiday weekend and the information we were given on Friday. Just rather be safe than sorry, have it come up on Sunday or Monday and then trying to scramble to let people know what was going on. But we reopened as usual on Tuesday. That's very Wednesday, good. Wednesday, I'm sorry. Under, those situ under the, the situation that you were working, I think I have to applaud the efforts that you all did because that's just amazing. Absolutely. Well, the emergency management team should get the credit. They were the ones keeping us informed of everything that was going on, what roads were closed. and and how we were uh, diverting our ambulance service around closed work roads and things of that nature. So, well, I'm, I'm so thankful it all worked out. Yeah. Uh, I did have one request from, uh, it wasn't a provider, it was actually uh, an, an employee, a nurse, who asked that if we loan out equipment uh, to the other hospital that it be returned. Just one. And then uh, I haven't, when is our new clinic scheduled to open? We're looking at beneficial occupancy. Um, we're actually pushing for that July 1st, um, a little bit prior to that so that we can get the, all the language correct with IHS and then we'll start looking at what services, once we get beneficial occupancy, it, what it does allows us to go into the facility without a hard hat and all the protective gear we have, life safety 
uh, in place. So once that happens, then we'll start looking at transition times. But that's part of the key right now is getting beneficial occupancy and getting access uh, where we can put people in there safely. Realizing that it's going to create over 800 new jobs, can you tell me how you're going to uh, bring those jobs about and uh, what the timetable may be? Can you uh, inform council? We've already started that process way back in uh, last year, identifying those positions we need to bring on early. Uh, that process already started in January. Uh, we have several people already hired to come in and, and start some of the initial processes. So they're training now. We're bringing them on so we can get them trained before we put them into the new building. Uh, we've identified providers that we're going to need right off the bat. So they're already being recruited. We're already talking to those people. Uh, we're, we're on pace of where we should be on our transition. Very good. Thank you so much. Anybody has any other questions? Dr. Jones, thank you. Sure. Appreciate it so much. Great report. Okay, uh, Cherokee Nation, <coughs> Home and Health, uh, and uh, let's see, Home and Health, <coughs> and Cherokee Nation Hospice. April, are you going to report for all these? Yes, yes, I'll do it. Glad to have you with us. Yeah, glad to be back. Uh, so we can go over this report we have, and then um, we can talk about, uh, there were some questions um, about uh, uh, expansion of services. Um, so we'll start with home health. Our census as of 523 was 236. Um, total Native Americans served between January 1st and March 31st was 231. Um, hospice census as of 523 was 15. Um, Native Americans served uh, was 34. Um, our outreach program, we had a total of 753 members. Um, the total all employees is 183. The majority of those are part-time. Um, Native Americans employees, we have 108, um, with 89 of those being Cherokee. Um, any questions on that? No, we can start about the expansion. Let's talk about the expansion. Okay. So um, there um, was some talks about what it would um, entail to purchase um, an existing NPI or existing agency. So we were able to do some research. We come across um, a few. Now, it was a little bit harder to get all the details because we're not actively in the market, so it was a little vague of what we could get. Um, but we found several um, in Oklahoma, northeastern Oklahoma, um, range, price range between 500 and a, a little over a million dollars. And that would be to purchase an existing agency. Um, one thing after we met last time, we um, were able to meet with some individuals and talk about the, um, the constituents that were not getting home services in their, in their area. Um, and I think it would be safe to say after talking is that I think it, what that is probably is a, a patient that did not have any kind of funding. Um, no Medicare, no Medicaid, and unfortunately the, for you know Cherokee Nation, there is no funding for um, any kind of home care services. So I think that that's huge and that would make a tremendous impact in, in all you know, areas if there was funding for citizens that needed some kind of home care or hospice that you know, they didn't have any kind of funding. We are, we're faced with it every day here, right here in, at home. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Madam Chairman. Yes. I think I'd ask, and I don't know how long it's been, what it would cost to buy a home health care service. Mm -hmm. Have you ever looked at that to see what it would cost to, to buy one? Right. So to purchase an existing, you're looking about half a million to a little over a million, depending on what you're going to purchase. Okay. And that would be an existing, already functioning agency, licensed, bill and Medicare, um, private insurance, and stuff like that. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, Councilor Crittenden. Ma'am, the Cherokee Nation Home Health and Cherokee Nation Hospice. Uh -huh. Hey, so, so who, who's the top here? Is it Cherokee Nation Chief? Is that the top? Is that the boss of this? I would. Yeah, we have a board of directors that is appointed by the chief, and I think the council votes on that as well. All right. Mm -hmm. So. But you are ran by Cherokee Nation. I believe so. My understanding, governed by the board of directors. 
<laughs> this, is, this is our weird, yeah. I don't say weird, similar to PACE in that they are independent corporations. Their board is appointed by the chief, um, by tribal council. It goes back to the court case, I think that their employees for the purpose of constitutional protections are considered employees of the Cherokee Nation, but they are not, they are a separate legal entity. They are not just a department or a branch of administration. They operate as a separate legal entity. They do their own payroll services. They do their own benefits. Some of those we share by an MOU, but they have different email addresses than us. They have different bank accounts than we do. So as a business, they are a separate entity. They're I guess, owned by the Cherokee Nation, but they're not operated through administration <coughs> just like a, a, a department is here. So the, the legal decision-making authority of them is their board of directors by their bylaws and articles of organization that they set out their LLC, correct? Mm -hmm. The similar, the setup is similar to that of, of PACE in that they're us for some purposes and not us for some purposes. Anyone else? Yes, Councilor Anglin. Is this, did we used to have this program in Claremore? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. We do cover Claremore for home health and, I've, and possibly hospice, depending on the miles and the address. I was thinking for the home health part. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. There we was do a, cover. There, I see a head shaking back okay. there. So. Yeah. I thought there was. <laughs> Anyone else? Council Warner. Yes, thank you. All right, April. Uh, so on the MPI number, the purchasing of the existing, what all does that, is that just the license? Is that, I mean, we're talking. You would purchase their whole good and bad. Building, the whole, mm -hmm. the whole existing. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. April, can you tell me how many requests monthly do you receive from Cherokee Nation? For non-funded patients, patients both. that. What, what do you mean? I mean, like, do you, you will actually bill Medicare, Medicaid, uh -huh, and private insurance. Uh -huh, yep. How many, how many uh, are most of these uh, covered services? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And can you give me an approximation of the number that are not? We don't take any non-funds. It's been that way since I've been there five or six years, and it's always been we don't accept any non-funded patients. So if they have no Medicare or Medicaid or insurance, you don't see them? No. So they fall between the cracks of the system. Exactly, exactly. And we, we deal with it almost daily, getting a phone call of somebody that could benefit from services, need services, <coughs> and we're not able to help. Um, there are some agencies out there that have um, the ability to take on some non-funds, but it's very limited, and that's what, um, you know, they get full in these. They have maybe three slots that are for non-funds, depending on their census or however they do it. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's this huge gap and unfortunately there are a lot of individuals that fall into that and i think i mean just to work in this every day that is where Cherokee nation can make a huge impact i see there i mean just seems easy to me but how we could get that fixed and get some some coverage to people that need it uh when you get these phone calls who are they usually from on the ones that are falling in the cracks of the system um so i would say um probably gosh almost all of them are coming from tulsa hospitals it's typically um hastings for or for whatever reason a, a patient has um, been transferred up to tulsa and they're ready to go home and they could benefit and probably get out of the hospital sooner if they had home health and so they 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 say their payer is cherokee nation and we just have to say unfortunately you know there's no home care funding there um, so it's most of the time it's from a Tulsa hospital. So April, what you're, you're saying, if I'm understanding this correctly, is Hastings has referred some of our citizens to Tal Tulsa hospitals. Uh -huh. They need home health care to uh, get the earlier discharge, uh -huh. but because they are non-funded, you can't take them. Right. Absolutely. That's tragic. It is. That very, is absolutely tragic. It is very sad. And, and so uh, since you fall under Cherokee Nation, may I ask, what would it do to your budget if you accepted them? I mean, how, how tight is the budget? Um, very tight. We're self-sustaining. We get no funding at all from Cherokee Nation. Um, so that would, it would be yeah, devastating if we were to take every single one. And how many daily would you say this uh, amounts to? You said I it's every day. So. Yeah, I would say we almost daily get a, call, a phone call, either home health or hospice. 
needing services. So we actually turned down hospice patients as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm heart sick on that. Yes. Okay, and so to change the scenario on this, you would need what? Funding. Funding. Mm -hmm. For home and care. Mm -hmm. This is something we need to think about, Council. Absolutely. This this is serious. It is very serious. Our mm -hmm. Cherokee citizens, if we can refer them up there, we at least ought to see them through the care to, to mm -hmm. get them back on their feet to yeah. recovery. Councilor Crick. Yeah, I would just... And I'm, I mean this question, I'm not trying to be smart or anything, but what what is Cherokee Nation-y about this? We don't fund it, so what is, what makes us stamp that Cherokee Nation? That was before my time. I don't, I'm not sure, we don't. <clears throat> Anybody understand my question? Yes, why Cherokee Nation? Uh, they just use our leverage. Uh, that we provide office space, correct? And no. What are we providing for you then? Uh, so I think this goes back to the, the formation issue, right? Yeah. So this is a, um, and I, I believe that those are both tribal corporations or are they state, do you know? Hey, ma'am, let me ask this just real quick. The reason I'm asking, you know, is of course all of us get, get the phone calls when our constituents see Cherokee Nation seal, mm -hmm. you know, they think we can actually do something about it. So I'll let so you put it in. This is similar. I think one that probably more people understand housing is the authority. housing authority. Housing authority. The, the Cherokee Nation appoints the board for that, but there is no, in, in the annual budget that this group approves, no money goes to Cherokee Nation Home Health Hospice. All the money that they make and spend comes from billing for their patients. Um, absent the board being um, appointed by the chief in this body, I don't think we have any Again, we share some HR stuff through an MOU, um, but they are they are not funded by us. And I believe that that is not that's also not a covered contract health. No, no. Nope. So, housing any is Do we pay any staff? Mm -mm. Is, the, is the board paid? Uh. -uh. Not to my not to my knowledge. I don't believe because it's the it's the same board for Pace, Home Health, and yeah, Hospice, so correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Com the comprehensive care agency, and there that board is not paid. A few of them, well, one of them, I believe, is a Cherokee Nation employee, um, but they're they're not they're not additionally compensated for that. And the rest of them are they basically serve as volunteers. Well, I appreciate what you do. You're helping people. Well, thank you. you know, we, course, we hope to help more. Of course, our job is we get the calls and what can we right. do. And, and we get so, those too because right. we have that stamp. Yeah. You know, they, well, yeah. you are Cherokee Nation. Why can't you help? And then we're referring them to you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, thank we you. try to help them as much as we can, though. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Councilor Watkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. The, um, I know a few situations where um, there's a, a daughter or son that has a parent or a grandparent that is unable to take care of themselves. And some of them are having to quit their jobs to take care of their, this family member. Uh, is, there, is there any program through this home health care that you guys could provide where the family member could take care of grandma, grandpa, or mom and dad, or brother and sister? Is, is, that, a, is that a service that you guys provide? Or? So there is some assistance and some programs that we can put into place to help take some of the burden off. But as far as like um, to come in and take over as a 24-hour caregiver, there's not. Not with our, within our agency. There are some private agencies out there, small little companies that do provide that type of care, but we do not. We can we can relieve some burdens through the you know the hospice program or home health or even our outreach program, which does more of like the running errands, cooking, cleaning, bathing, those types of things. But as far as a, a live-in 24 caregiver, we do not. Okay. Speaker Burke. Yes. <clears throat> April, first I want to commend you on the, the position that you have and what you do for Thank our you. people, you and your staff. Uh, we were asking you some questions probably that come that needs to come from a higher up, the answers. But uh, what, what I would uh, like to have, and maybe for the committee here, we need some numbers on how many, and what kind of numbers are we talking about? We say we, we, we received so many phone calls, we denied so many patients uh, uh, getting back to their homes from Tulsa or wherever they're uh -huh. referred out to. If we could get some numbers okay. 
and then uh, then we could have a better idea how we could address this from a budget standpoint. Okay, we can do that. Does that make Very sense, Committee? Yeah. Well, I'd like to even see like what's the average cost daily. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yep. yep. Yeah. We can do that. Yes, Councilor Buzzer. Uh, that what Councilor Shaw brought up it, it concerns me about hospice and then sending people home that don't have any body to take care of. No, I didn't I didn't know that. Now we have a Cherokee home health company. Uh -huh. And Chrissy, is that is that Cherokee operated Cherokee? That's what we're talking about. For oh. the public health? No, I see cars up in the yeah. That's Road us. Uh -huh. So that's, that's you. That's us. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay, well yeah. I was under the impression it was a separate organization. Okay, well that, that's my concern. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hey, April, thank you for coming today. I, I know we've got to give you some homework for some that's, more information. That's great. I'm thank so you. glad that you're sharing that with Council. Thank you. Good report. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, Councilor Austin. <laughs> I, I'm figuring out why we're e why that's even got our name on it. Because uh, we don't fund you. You don't make a profit that returns back to the Cherokee Nation. Um, our people get nothing extra that they wouldn't get if they were using a, a, a third party. Uh, we don't take care of anybody who is not being, uh, who's not a Cherokee. I mean, we don't, we don't take care of anybody who's not funded. Why are we in this business? What, what, is there a reason why we're in this business? I don't understand why we're putting ourselves in a liability standpoint if we're not receiving something more than we would be receiving by using a free market uh, supplier for this service. True. Well, like Councilor Critton said, though, it's got that Cherokee Nation name on there. When they has that name on there, somewhere in there we feel responsible. That's what I'm saying. Just we like we have a liability, center. but are we receiving any extra service out of it? I'm not seeing that. And so we either need to come up with the reason to where it, it has extra service for Cherokee people, or we need to uh, use these funds, you know, let the free market take care of this one. Because I don't see why we're in this business if we're not benefiting from it. And I don't see that we're benefiting from it. Seems like we, you know, if we, it's got our name on it, we should at least get a franchise fee. <laughs> <I'm saying. laughs> Councilor Walkingstick. Uh, Councilman Austin, this, this, uh, your comment about that, I mean, it's kind of like CNI and our government aid aid contracts. They're not making us a lot of money, but they're providing jobs and, and service to the government. This, uh, this program right here does uh, specifically target Cherokees in, in our area, and it provides jobs. And uh, it is self-sustaining. It's not a good business venture. We're not making a lot of money off of it, but uh, this is this is a good service, and it's a it's a good it's a good program. Mm -hmm. And I, I I wish that the Cherokee Nation could put more money into it to provide more services for more Cherokees because I have seen the impact of what you guys do, and uh, and so I definitely appreciate it. I don't want to take the service away. But having Cherokee Nation affiliate with it, we have a little more control over who we're targeting, you know. And so that's that, that's my response. Uh, oh, Chair. Councilor Austin, did you want to follow that? I, I suspect that probably when it was founded, there was a, a reason why we founded it because of a lack in the market, a lack of it wasn't available in community or something like that. Uh, so we need to find out what, why we have it and then where we need to go with it. Uh, Councilor Officer, I, I agree with that. Uh, how long has this been in operation? I should know, but I don't. I want to say um, when it first started, it was in the 80s, something that I've read. Does that seem right? Have you read that? Yeah, I think like 86 to 89. It's changed. Oh, uh, yes, scope. it started, uh, mm -hmm. it started well, as a program. We have close to 100 and, what, 70 employees here? And maybe half for Cherokee. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need to take a long, hard look at it. The structure. See if we can't, you know, maybe maybe make some changes uh, where it would benefit more of our Cherokee mm -hmm. people. Uh, we need to take a look at it because uh, as we're talking about this, I 
it don't seem like we have very many answers here. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> it sounds like a good concept. Yeah. Uh, it's trying to help our people. We're providing some jobs. Mm -hmm. It seems like we could improve upon it. I agree. Okay. If you agree, then that's 100%. a good start. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Last, last question, Councillor Buzzard. Well, I, I, I beg to remember when this came about, and I think Norma Merriman had this up years ago, and we looked at doing six of those pace sites. Alcohol was one, Stillwell was another one. And I said, well, what about Jade? She said, well, they didn't really qualify, so they were going to move it on further north. So they were actually six of those sites that were projected to look at, but only one got funded, and that was here in Tahlequah. But that's been probably 12, 14, 12, 13 years ago when it started. So it never went any further than the one pay site here in Tahlequah. So, but anyway, I think it's a good idea. I think it's good. Yeah, like uh, Councilor said, it provides jobs and it does provide some services. So, and I think the reason it has Cherokee Nation on there because Cherokee Nation actually went after the grant money at that time. Okay, hmm. okay. Uh, I think we're going to have to end, uh, round this off at the end of April. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will be looking forward to seeing you at the next our, our next meeting over here. I do want to share that Cherokee <laughs> Elder Care could not be here today; that they were flooded and had to. Uh, uh, missed their meeting last month and their meeting today but uh, Thelma Pittman did send a report and she will be here next month at our meeting to uh, share information with us and I will take a motion to adjourn. Take a motion we adjourn. Second. Ten All minutes. those in favor? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes.